I have the privilege of introducing the next speaker, who is well known to all of us. Evelyn uh, Typher is uh, the chair of reproductive biology in Edinburgh, and she's going to talk to us about the function, the sources of autologous mitochondria in the ovary. And Evelyn. I remind you what we were told <laughs> about the time. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm not going to speak about mitochondria. I'm rather I'm going to speak about cells that have been used um, in in autologous mitochondria transfer. And Bob Casper will speak about the, this um, in the in the last um, presentation. So um, the cells that I'm going to speak about. Uh, uh, firstly, the declaration. Um, I do have a research grant from um, OvaScience. Um, the work that I'm going to describe has not been funded by OvaScience. It was funded by the Medical Research Council in the, in the UK. Um, so, to start with then, they, um, in 2012, a paper was published that came from John Tilley's lab. And in that paper, they showed that they could isolate a population of cells from the adult human ovary. Now, this work came within the context of previous work that was done in the mouse that suggested that such a population existed in the adult mouse ovary. And the group in Shanghai, Jia Wu's group in China, they had also shown that there was a population of cells that were putative germline stem cells within the mammalian ovary. But this was the first paper that showed that such a population could be identified within the adult human ovary. And how they um, monitored these cells or identified these cells was they, they pulled them down using an antibody to DDX4, which is an RNA helicase. It's also um, known as uh, VASA, so you'll see it's VASA. And they could co-localize within these cells DDX4 and BRDU. So they had a population of cells that they described as being of germline, but could also proliferate. So they had done some experiments where they took these cells, they labeled, labeled them with the green fluorescent protein, and then they um, injected them into human ovarian cortical tissue, and then trans, um, uh, they, they put them under the, the kidney capsule of the immunodeficient mouse. And what they found was, when they analyzed the cortical tissue that had been transplanted, they found that the oocytes were green, so came from the cells, and the somatic cells were just normal. They, they had not come from the cells, they had come from the tissue that the cells had been injected into. So this gave them... Um, you know, information, and they concluded, the, the Tilly group concluded, that these cells were indeed a, a population of cells that were not, born, you know, real sort of stem cells, but they were in indeed unipotent um, cells. So they had limited um, re uh, ability to renew, and they could also only go down the pathway towards a germline, no other cell. They wouldn't make any other, other cell type. Now, at that time, they'd also um, done work on the mitochondria of these cells, and they, at that time, or before the paper was published, they had applied for a patent on, on this. But they made conclusions about the mitochondria of these cells, and because they were quiescent cells, that these would be appropriate for autologous transfer into oocytes in terms of improving um, the health of the oocytes. And we'll hear more about that in the next presentation. So what about these cells, though? What do we know about the cells that are in the adult ovary, and what are the characteristics of these putative um, germline stem cells? So this is a, a, an illustration of what we know about the ovary. And we know that the ovary is formed, or the primordial follicles, and we heard um, from Sherman Silver this morning and David Albertini about primordial follicles that are formed before birth. And there's a population of these follicles, and they will be there for a long time within the human ovary. And these follicles are initiated to grow throughout life, and of course, in a monoovular species, only one of them will ever reach ovulation during the time of the, of the, of the cycle. 
But it's um, always been, or since the 1950s, it's been an assumption that the mammalian ovary does not have the capacity for regeneration. And that's a bold statement because many ovaries of other species do have the capacity for regeneration. And indeed, we've also known for many years that there are mammals, the prosimian primates, who probably do have the capacity for regeneration, but it's never really been studied in any de detail. So this was quite a revelation, and it was very controversial when cells within the adult human ovary were identified as perhaps having the potential to form new oocytes because it went against the dogma that everyone adhered to in, in reproductive biology. So the question then was, I um, at that time was very skeptical about these cells, but had an opportunity to test these cells. So we asked the question of whether the ovarian tissue that we were working on in terms of a culture system, whether these um, cells could be supported within the tissue and indeed form what would be um, classified as, as oocytes. So this was a system that we were working on and, and indeed still are working on. And you heard from Sherman this morning and Sherman said no one can culture primordial follicles. Well, I think that's come as a big surprise to me, probably to Helen Picton and definitely to John Epig, who cultured primordial follicles from the mouse all the way through to mature oocytes, fertilized them and had live young. So primordial follicles can be cultured. But, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to know about the regulation of primordial follicles. So we um, take the primordial follicles that are within a microcortex of the um, human ovary and we prepare it and we activate it and then we activate the primordial follicles, get growing follicles and then we take them through various steps of the culture in order to get mature oocytes. And this is human uh, culture that I'm, I'm talking about here. So this is the initiation of um, follicles within the, the culture system, and they will form large multilaminar structures, so large preantral follicles within this system. And then we dissect those follicles out. And when we dissect them out, you can see here them growing. We dissect out these follicles, and we grow them for a further period of time until they form an antral cavity. And then when they formed an antral cavity, we then take the oocyte and its surrounding cells. And I think what we've heard this morning is the most important aspect of oocyte development is that communication between the oocyte and its surrounding cells. That has to be um, optimum for oocyte development. So we grow this for a further period of time and then we test their capacity to undergo maturation and some of these oocytes are capable of maturing, they're capable of um, resuming meiosis and emitting a, a polar body. So in vitro development to a point, now whether they're completely normal or not, then there's a lot of work that has to be done, but it can be achieved um, for, for human to, to that stage. So when we um, started a dialogue with John Tilly and his lab, they asked us if we would take the cells that they had isolated and had transfected with the green fluorescent protein, if we would take those cells and inject them into our microcortex and then monitor whether new oocytes could be formed in the in vitro system. And we did this and we really didn't think much would come of this. But after seven days when we monitored this tissue, we could see small green fluorescent cells, but we could also see larger structures. And we were very curious about these structures. We couldn't get much detail using the fluorescent probe, so we then looked at the tissue um, using a chromogenic marker to actually see what these oocyte or these structures looked like. And what we could see when we did the chromogenic marker, we could see small cells like the cells that had been injected in, and then we could see larger cells, sort of round structures, and all the brown for the green fluorescent protein is in these larger structures, there's nothing anywhere else. And then you can see that these structures are forming associations with somatic cells. And in this image here, 
This looks just like an oocyte. It just looks like a primordial follicle. You can see the nucleus, you can see that it's brown, and nothing else is. And the somatic cells, they've not taken up the stain, so they must have come from the tissue that was, um, the cells were injected into. So this really made us sit up and, and pay attention and think, well, what are these cells? We really need to start to try and isolate these cells and see what the potential of them um, really might be. And so this is just another um, image to show you that, of course, there's still primordial follicles in this tissue that we're injecting the cells into, but you can see side by side um, a cell or an oocyte-like structure that is brown, so therefore came from the GFP cells, and there's no other GFP. Now, we've heard a lot of things, and I'm probably the most cynical person that you could um, come across, so we've tried to think, well, how else might you explain this result? And one of the ideas, or someone said, well, maybe the GFP leaks into cells. And maybe it does, but why would it leak into only oocyte-looking structures? And why, when they're side by side, one would be brown and the other one wouldn't? So the leaking into a you know, hypothesis doesn't really um, you know, carry any, hold any water. And the other thing that we've done is we've lysed these cells, and they've just got GFP, and we inject them in to the tissue, and we never, ever get these structures formed when we do that. So we think there's strong evidence that these cells are indeed forming what appear. And I'll say what appear because, of course, the test of the oocyte is when it resumes meiosis, it completes my or it gets fertilized, completes meiosis, and it forms an embryo. And that hasn't been done in this tissue yet because there's um, various other problems associated with doing that. And these are main, mainly regulatory problems. But you can see that um, oocyte-like structures are formed and they're within what appear to be large multilaminar um, follicles. So something's going on there. So these were cells that we had obtained from John Tilly's lab. And it was our goal to see, well, how reproducible is this system? Is it an easy procedure to do? And why were we doing this? Well, because we were interested in the cells. But also, there were several groups that were saying, we've tried to isolate these cells, and we cannot isolate them. They're not there. They're, they, they don't exist. And I, I hear this all the time. These cells don't exist. So we started the process of um, trying to isolate the cells using more or less the same procedure that John Tilly had, uh, he had, had published. And of course, with all procedures, it wasn't straightforward. There were things that we did have to adapt, particularly with the digestion um, when we were dissociating the tissue. Maybe we, in our hands, that was too harsh. So we, we had to adapt things to ensure that we had viability. But we did use the uh, DDX4 as a basis of isolating these cells. And again, that was a controversial um, area. But essentially, we were using fact sorting to obtain a positive population of cells for DDX4 and a negative population. Now, DDX4 is in all the oocytes. And when you do a digestion, DDX4 is everywhere. And it's probably coating lots and lots of the cells. So you have to have quite stringent criteria for your sorting, your gates of the facts, but also for the size of the cells that you actually um, you know, extract or that you use, because you, know, you might be taking false positives. So we sort of uh, modified the, 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 the sorting procedure for, in our hands to obtain a population of what we believe to be DDX4 positive and DDX4 negative. Now we had some subtle changes um, within the fact sorting as well, which I'm not going to go into, but it was to do with the degree of intensity of the, the DDX4 um, labeling. And we identified what we would have called, uh, through that intensity, three different populations of DDX4 um, cells. And then we had the negative cells here. So the negative cells never showed DDX4 by PCR, but the positive cells all did. And the interesting um, thing that we saw was that only one of the populations showed dazzle. So we think that what we're seeing is some kind of subpopulations that might reflect their degree of differentiation. And that's something that we're, we're looking into. 
Then we looked at um, other germline markers, and of course the negative cells have some of these markers, but they don't have all of them. And stem cell markers, negative cells have, again, some of the stem cell markers, but not all of them. But the, um, what we would refer to as the, the positive, the DDX4 positive cells, they have all of the markers. They have germline markers and stem cell markers, but they don't have follicle or oocyte markers. So they're not oocytes. So they're a cell within the human ovary, adult human ovary, that are positive for DDX4 and have germline and stem cell markers. So we um, wanted to look at those in a bit more detail. And again, there was information that was coming out. Yeah, we can isolate cells, um, but they don't, they're not positive for DDX4. DDX4 is a bit of a ruse. Now, most of the studies that have looked at DDX4, either by PCR or by Western blotting, have all used cultured cells. They've cultured up their, their cells, and there may be changes in, in culture. So we were able to get enough cells to analyze them immediately, because that's the important time, the ones that we're actually getting at the fact sorting. And what we found was that yet the positive cells have the protein, and this is just two different antibodies that we use to pull down the cells. The positive cells have DDX4 and the negative cells don't. So in the strategy that we're using, there's discrete populations that can be identified on the basis of um, DDX4. When we do the immunocytochemistry for uh, DDX4, of course, the oocytes all have DDX4. And um, the, if we go through all of the tissue, we can start to see small cells within the ovi, uh, human ovary that are positive for DDX4. We use skeletal muscle as a control because we don't find DDX4 in skeletal muscle, but DDX4 is present in other tissue. It's present in the brain, it's present in the kidney. So, but within the ovary, it's only, or we've assumed that it's only associated with the germline because it is um, you know, predominantly in the, in the oocyte. So you can see here these small cells that are located throughout the ovarian cortex which we're assuming are the cells that we're pulling down when we use DDX4 antibody um, during the fax, uh, the fax procedure. So this is controversial, and it's controversial because DDX4 is an RNA helicase, and again, there has been an assumption that because of what uh, uh, DDX4 does, that it will only be intracellular, and it mainly is intracellular. RNA helicases are, but there's no intrinsic reason why they're not expressed, or they cannot be expressed on the surface. So the hypothesis is that DDX4 is expressed on the surface in these early cells, and then internal in the, in the oocyte. So we asked the question whether we could express um, DDX4 on the surface if we integrated DDX4 into um, hex, hex cells. And this had been done um, by other groups, and they said that they couldn't see um, a surface expression of DDX4. So essentially, that's what we're looking to see if we can um, find that in, in, uh, in, in our hands. So we got the full length DDX4, and we um, transfected it. We put it into um, hex cells, and we saw that these cells were, in fact, producing um, DDX4. So it was, you know, functional, it seemed to be working. And then we attached, sorry, I should have said, we attached the um, um, MIC to the C terminus here. So we were going to then look to see if we could see, uh, if we could identify MIC on the surface of, of the cells. So when we looked at the non-permeabilized cells, this is our control. So that B will be internal to the cell. So we shouldn't see any, um, and we've still got MIC there, we shouldn't see any fluorescence in these cells at all, and we don't. But when it's DDX4 that's there with the MIC um, tag, we do see um, fluorescence. So we're saying that it's expressed on the surface of these, these cells. And of course, in the permeabilized cells, you'll see it because you've opened um, up, up the cell. So DDX4 can be um, on, the, on the surface. And then we went on to test the potential of our cells. Now, we've isolated these cells in a range of species, but uh, most of the work has been done on human and in the cow. So in our cow experiments, we did some chimeric experiments 
where we combined these cells, the bovine cells, with mouse somatic cells. And that was really a way you know, that we could monitor wh which cells were, were which. And then we transplanted them under the kidney capsule of the, the skid mouse. So essentially taking these mouse somatic cells and the um, bovine organial stem cells or putative organial stem cells and then did the xenotransplantation. And this was in collaboration with Susanna Williams in, in Oxford and Kelsey Greaves, a PhD student, who went there and did this work. So when we just took somatic cells and we transplanted them under the kidney capsule, you can see here when we um, retrieved the transplant, there were no germ cells present, it was just somatic cells. And in fact, quite often the somatic cells would be resorbed, the, 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 these transplants would be resorbed, they didn't hold their structure um, very well. But when we had the, um, the, the bovine organo stem cells and we mixed them with the somatic cells, we could in fact see follicle formation and on oocyte formation. And the size of the oocyte and its kind of developmental sequence was more in line with a bovine oocyte rather than a, a mouse um, oocyte. But we've got a lot of analysis that we're doing on these oocytes and that's, that's all um, ongoing. So our conclusion is that these cells were capable of forming um, these uh, structures. Now, we heard again from Sherman this morning, um, you know, about being able to make new eggs from induced pluripotent stem cells and from embryonic stem cells. And of course, it's fantastic work that the, the groups in Japan are, are doing. Um, but key to the development is, of course, the somatic cells. Now, whether you start with an induced pluripotent stem cell, an embryonic stem cell, or indeed these cells that we're getting um, from the, the human and the bovine ovary, then we need to make sure that they have appropriate somatic cell support. So that's the, the key in this um, whole process. And of course, making gametes, as we heard from David Albertini as well, is not an easy process. It's a very difficult process. And we have to ensure that all of the developmental steps can be recapitulated either in vivo through a transplant model or in vitro. And that's what we've been working on with these cells now, is a, a in vitro model to recapitulate the process of oocyte and follicle development um, to the point where we have you know, more mature um, oocytes. So this is what we've been working on and we've been doing this in the bovine and human, and I'm not gonna speak about the human work, but in the bovine work, then we can um, get these uh, follicles to, or they, they appear to form um, follicles. We do mark the cells here with uh, rhodamine so we can follow the cells and this is just showing you when we combine them in vitro for a short period of time when we start to look at the cells within seven days we start to see structures that are um, looking like they may be uh, oocytes and so we're now um, you know analyzing these in terms of oocyte markers and of course looking at the somatic cells that are surrounding them and we're working on different types of somatic cells to try and support their, their development. So in conclusion then or in summary we'd say that there's a distinct population of cells with germ and stem cell markers that can be isolated from the ovaries of women and prepubertal girls, and these have also been isolated from uh, Turner's patients. So this population of cells is in the adult ovary and in a range of species. It is a useful model, as is the stem cell model, to um, study human germ cell development and maturation, because it's very difficult to study these processes. Um, we, we only really have the mouse model that, that can take things all the way, but this would be a good model for human development. Of course, there's clinical applications, and we, we're all aware of them in terms of fertility preservation, but there's a lot of work that still has to be done. But something that has been going on in terms of the utilization of these cells is their mitochondria, because it's thought that because they come from the germline, or they represent the germline, then that these mitochondria would be a, a, a good source of mitochondria in terms of the, the transfer uh, to improve oocyte health. And uh, Bob's going to speak about, about that. So the future then of this work is mired in controversy. There's no doubt about that. But it's a new field. 
It's a very new field. And, but the concentration and the effort in this field has been in doubting their existence. And it's almost become a religion. And it's like, I don't believe in these, you know, and no one's asking people to have blind faith and believing, uh, you know, something that you can't provide any evidence for. But the reality is, or the fact is, that we know very little about the working of the mammalian ovary in general and the human ovary in particular. And there must be lots of population of as yet unidentified cells within the human ovary. And I think we're getting a, t a feel now that, yeah, there's some of these cells. We don't know their physiological role, but they certainly have the characteristics of a germline um, stem cell, or at least a, a unipotent um, cell. So they've been identified. Cells with these characteristics have been identified in a range of species now. And of course, now people who are working in this field, it's, it's time to define these populations uh, that reside within the mature ovary and trying to apply some of the cell-based strategies to tackling um, infertility treatment and fertility um, preservation. So I'll finish on that and I'll thank the people who do the work. And in the lab, it's uh, Marie McLaughlin, Yvonne Clarkson, Sheldon Lopp and Kelsey Grieve are the main people who have been involved in, these, um, in this uh, project. And then my collaborators within um, Edinburgh as well, Richard Anderson, Hamish Wallace, the clinicians, David Albertini, who's helped us, uh, done a lot with the in vitro growth work and the analysis of the in vitro grown oocytes. John Tilly, who gave us the opportunity to work with these cells, and Susanna Williams in Oxford. And it was the Medical Research Council that funded this work and all the patients who gave us the tissue to, to work on. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.